Hello and welcome to the Architecture Lecture. Now, most of the content for this flipped classroom pedagogy course, pedagogy course, uh, is, is split up into little bite-sized content sections made publicly available so that in the future you can go back and review it with, uh, with Brightspace and, and for the most part you haven't had to sit through any actual lectures. Well, not today. Today we're going back to the traditional collegiate academic style of speaking, making wild hand gestures, and having visual aids behind me. Uh, and that's, that's turns out it's a pretty good way to teach. Uh, this is the architecture lecture. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna, you know, I got the standing desk, I got the coffee, I got, I got the trying to bring the energy of a traditional lecture into the camera in front of me. Here we go. Um, so let's, let's just get into it. My camera misses focus, doesn't matter. I'm here, I'm in the corner, I'm in my box. Uh, let's talk code architecture. The architecture, I'm, we mean it metaphorically. We're not making buildings, we're not pouring cement, we're not walking around with large tubes of paper rolled up. <laughs> what do architects do? <laughs> they, they, you know, they walk around on building sites, but they're, but they're dressed nice at the same time, I guess. Um, <laughs> this is gonna be a weird one. We're, you know, one take wonder, we're gonna go for it. Uh, code architecture, this is the big picture planning processes of writing our code. This is where we put our code, this is how we manage our code, this is how we make decisions about like, uh, what should this be? What should this component do? Uh, where should I put it? How do I, how do I assemble everything? How do I architect everything? Uh, the big picture, the strategies. This is not grammar. This is not syntax. We're not going to be talking about semicolons and curly braces today. Uh, none of that gross, gross typing. There's construction outside my window. I got the loud, loud mic here to, to help with that, but apologies. Let's Let's go. Uh, anyone know what this is? Oh, see here, I know I'm talking to a camera. <laughs> I gotta pause, I gotta pause. This construction's not that good. Okay, the sounds seem to have died down. I hope that doesn't become a thing. Uh, does anyone know what this is? Correct, it's Hot Wheels. I'm gonna be the Dora Explorer energy here today in the video. Uh, Hot Wheels, Hot Wheels. Y'all know Hot Wheels? You got the orange track, you take the car, you go, pew. Love Hot Wheels. Uh, so we, <laughs> when we write our code, uh, we can imagine our Hot Wheels as uh, uh, the code, because you know we, our code only does one thing at a time. It goes from statement to statement to statement to statement to statement. Just like the Hot Wheels car just goes down our track, one little track section at a time. Um, so if we have something like this, uh, you know that might be like an if statement. Does the car go left or does it go right? Although looking at it now, it looks like it's looks like this is more of an end of an if statement branching back into the, the main thread. Um, uh, some 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 track like this. We have a bunch of cars going down. That's right, coroutines, threading. Gosh, have we even talked about that? Yeah, multiple things executing at the same time. Oh, love that. And of course, everyone knows that that this fun fun thing would just be it would be errors, would be error game breaking, a stack of overflow exception. Uh, so architecture, we're not, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out what, uh, not how to put all the little pieces together, but we're trying to look at the big picture of this racetrack and, and, and make it not a fun, messy racetrack, but a cleanly organized, simple, easy to understand, easy to add sections to and remove um, racetrack. So, <laughs> uh, that's my Hot Wheels metaphor. Um, it's, you know, it's, uh, what makes for a fun Hot Wheels track does not make for fun code. Um, so, of course, we are architects, we are planning, we are drafting, we are writing up diagrams that look like, that look like this, uh, but not really, not really. Um, we need to have a plan, a battle plan, to write our code. Um, and that is what we are going over today. I think I already introed this part. And come on, we go. So, in this lecture, we're going to go over core concepts of a code architecture. We're going to go over the goals of what we are trying to achieve when we write our code. We're going to go over some strategies of how we go about achieving this thing. Um, and then the tools and tricks section is going to be actually our in-class part. After you've watched this video, we will um, do some exercises to uh, enforce it. So um, I put a bunch of memes in the PowerPoint because uh, they're fun. I guess, I don't know, 
I don't know what the like slightly irreverent like reaction is going to be to the memes in this video <laughs> format. Usually this is like a little bit of a tongue in cheek, like hello fellow children's kind of kind of joke that I that I bring to the to the energy. But uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of memes just scattered about. Ease your pacing of the video. You can pause and enjoy them at your own <laughs> at your at your leisure. <laughs> Core concepts, vocabulary. Uh, basically, yeah, vocabulary. We're going we're going over vocab. Um, Yeah, this this is the vocab we're going over. Dependencies, interfaces, generalization, repetition, spaghetti code, over abstraction, flexible code, modular, parents and children, singletons. Where's my mouse? Memes. Um, the memes are just like me taking a coffee break. How about that? <sighs> Dependencies. A dependency is when one object it requires another object to exist in order for the first object to function. So for example, I am dependent on my cat. <laughs> if, the cat if my cat stopped existing, I would, no, no, hold on, hold on. I got sad, don't, stop. Uh, my cat is also dependent on me because I feed you. Yeah, if I wasn't around, if I died tragically, you would, you would not be doing good. Let's, say, let's make this less morbid and more cute. Hey, look at this goody cat. Okay. Oh. <clears throat> A dependency, uh, two, that got real dark real fast, and I'm not, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that energy level I'm bringing here. Uh, two objects requiring each other to exist is an interdependency. My cat and I are interdependent. One object requiring another object to exist is a dependency. Um, so we want to avoid interdependencies wherever we can. We always want to avoid the situation where the player has like a health bar and the player is like, hey, health bar, here's my new score. And the health bar is like, hey, player, tell me your position uh, or something like that, um, where they're both dependent on each other. We want these to be one way things so that if I got rid of one of them, the other one would keep working. Maybe not vice versa, but at least that can be true in one direction. Um, so we avoid interdependencies wherever we can and we minimize dependencies wherever we can. Um, we can't get rid of dependencies, otherwise our code wouldn't work. Uh, we need some amount of things talking to each other, uh, especially in Unity development. Um, so, so these are our, our dependencies. Um, so this is, this is some example code. Um, this is uh, the, a, uh, uh, a input class that tells a controller that moves a character around um, like when I push the input of the buttons, it tells the controller, hey, move as a reaction. It handles the input for it. So it is dependent on that controller existing. For Unity, these are components, so we can, it's dependent on the uh, components being both added to the same game object. Um, and that, that makes sense in this situation. It would be weird to add the input and not have the controller, so like that dependency feels all right, but we wouldn't want it to go be interdependent. We wouldn't want to need the input. Um, for example, where's my mouse? Okay. Uh, an interface. This is the, uh, we have a few words for interface. This is the I and API, application programming interface. Um, this is a connection or boundary between multiple systems. Um, so interfaces are like the public functions that we can call um, so I can, we can tell something to do something. Um, so when we write code that has an interface, that has some like pub layer, uh, where other code must go through to get to the R code's internals, uh, that allows us to change all the internals without changing the interface, and then none of our other code systems need to change. Oh, that's so good. That's what we want to do. Um, in C Sharp, there's a thing called an interface that allows us to do this kind of programming pattern, but um, that's a very specific thing, and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking very broadly about the idea of like an accessing layer. <laughs> that doesn't change while we can mess with the internals. Um, so, for example, uh, the character controller from the previous example has a public function called move. And the input system doesn't need to know anything about the controller, how it moves, and it doesn't need to know if the player can move. Uh, we would have the controller handle all that error checking, all that handling. We could, you know, right now, this example, it doesn't, it could go through walls. We want to add collisions. We can do that on the controller and the input class, the lower one here, doesn't need to change at all. It just says, hey, you gotta move. 
um, please do so, or don't, or whatever, <laughs> um, and so on. Next, the term abstract, also called generalized. We abstract things, we generalize things. Um, I'm, we're gonna, I'm gonna stick to the word generalized when talking about code architecture, because the word abstract is actually a keyword in programming that, you guessed it, allows us to do this kind of pattern, generally. Um, but we're not going over abstract code, we're going over generalized code. <laughs> We're not going over specifically the C-sharp keyword and feature of abstract, what it means to make a class abstract. We're going over the idea of uh, making things less specific. Um, so any code that is less specific or that we can use in more places uh, is generalized. And that's a good thing. Um, using the input system, uh, Unity's input system that allows me to use get button down, where I can then go to the input system and remap that later, that's better than just using the get key down for a keyboard because it allows me to go and add gamepad support um, and, and make those changes in the future. Um, I got a little story in, on the slide here of a time I wrote, I spent a long time writing a little uh, level parser where I could write up my, I had this 2D grid of a game and I could write up my game as like, you know, a bunch of hashtag symbols for walls and like periods for empty spaces and a P for the player and I could write my levels as little text files. It was very cool. Um, and I wrote this awesome little text and I had, I had a game that I was like, oh, my, I just making little TXT files for the levels. That feels really cool. I, you know, I enjoyed it. And then I had another game that had a similar grid and I was like, aha, I'm gonna use my level parser. I already wrote that thing, I'm gonna use it. And I brought that code in and I had to rewrite the whole thing from scratch, basically, because uh, it was just too, it was too specific. It was too built into exactly how that code worked. Um, I wasn't able to take it and put it in a new project. Um, so generalizing our code is a good thing, but you also don't want to do it <laughs> when your time is better spent doing something else, like figuring out if your game is fun or making it work. <laughs> uh, generalizing is a good thing to do, but it's usually a mistake to do it too early on in the process. It's usually we write specific code, then we go back, we do something called refactoring, we rewrite our code to be a bit more general, a bit more flexible. Um, so you want to generalize your code sort of later in development and not necessarily right from the get-go. Um, as you get better at programming, you'll be able to write that more general code right from the start. And that's just like something you'll improve at. But as you learn, I encourage you to, you know, not write 500 lines of code before you can even hit play and just get something working. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, so here's an example. Up top, we have a function that looks for the closest enemy to you. And down below, we have basically the exact same code uh, but it has been generalized um, by renaming the functions. Uh, so it's no longer looking for the closest enemy. We're just looking for the closest transform component. And we can give it a list of enemies. We can get a, give it a list of trees or cups of coffee or whatever game objects we have that have transforms. All of them do. Um, and we can, uh, you know, use this function all over the place. We've generalized it. Um, uh, you'll notice in the first one, it is inside of the start function, looking for the closest enemy, just right at start. Only happens in that one place. Um, and then down below, it's its own function. I've taken it, I've moved it into its own function, and now I can, inside of start, if I needed to do that, I could call get closest transform, but I could also use that anywhere else. Uh, repetition um, is bad. Repetition. It's, um, it's bad. Repetition is bad. See what I did there? Um, <laughs> I, I hope you just groaned in, in annoyance at that one. Uh, if you ever write your code multiple times, if you ever hit copy and hit paste, that should just be like an immediate, like, like flashing red lights, like, hello, the, the, uh, alert, danger, danger. You may not be doing something wrong, but you probably are. Uh, if you ever copy and paste. Um, repetition is bad. Um, sometimes taking copy and pasted code and turning it into a function and then just calling the function a few times, that feels like a, a chore that isn't necessary. It's like, oh, I mean, I'm only using it in three places. It's fine, whatever. Um, it's not, it's good. You should definitely do this anyway. That way you only need to make an adjustment or a change. You only need to do it once. Uh, if you need to like fix a typo. And it's especially important when you're working on teams. 
you're almost always going to be working on teams. It's, it's an odd thing that our, our, our curriculum has not had too many team projects. Um, we, we're going to have team projects. <laughs> uh, uh, so if, uh, if you get paid to write code, you're working on a team. Uh, minimizing repetition you know, is, is one of the many things where you know, someone else goes in, they fix some code, but they didn't change the changes. Oh, gosh, you've, you, now it's all broken. Didn't change the, the repetitions. Um, so it allows it to be more, more, you know, you make a change in one place and everything, sh it should change, right? You shouldn't have to, someone else shouldn't have to know they have to also make that go over there and find the copy and pasted code. Uh, so here's some code that I once wrote. <laughs> this was on a game jam, a 48-hour uh, game jam. And this was like an hour or two hours before the, uh, like the morning of the, uh, the finish. And I was like, I need, I'm adding more enemy types. I need to figure this out. Um, what I needed to do was abstract the enemy, uh, enemy to have a base class of enemy that had the functions I needed, and then, um, gosh, it doesn't matter what I need to do. This, this isn't it, though. <laughs> I was like, I was like, hadn't slept in 36 hours, uh, copy and paste, it's gonna work, we gotta just move on, I can't care about it. Um, turns out, should have cared about it. Anyway, uh, yes, if else statements, love it. <clears throat> spaghetti code. Uh, spaghetti code. Whoops. I'm not. Where's my mouse? Spaghetti code. Um, unstructured code. Code that doesn't have a clear plan. Code that code that doesn't have a clear hierarchical, top-down category. You know, this belongs to this. This belongs to this. It doesn't have a structure that's visible, visible, readable, understandable. Uh, it is code that is like this references that, and this uses this thing, and that talks to that system, and this system's over here, and boop, 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 boop. all your references are. All your dependencies are all over the place. And if you were to map it out uh, and map out all your references and dependencies and things like that, uh, it would look like a big old plate of spaghetti. Um, it's bad. We hate it because it makes it very difficult to chase down bugs. Uh, it makes it very difficult to, you know, make anything work. So spaghetti code, common frame. Also, you will write spaghetti code. So sorry about that. Sorry to tell you about that. Um, So uh, that's all. I'm not going to, uh, I can't show you all of my terrible code I've written. <laughs> Just trust me that I have written terrible code and we'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, some more memes. Um, over abstracted. Previously I talked about how generalization is like good, but there's a limit. There's a limit. Simplicity over complexity, complexity over complicatedness. <laughs> um, and then a quote from my friend Alec Gorge, who works, ooh, this slide is out of date. He now works at Discord. He's a engineer there, uh, software engineer there. Uh, if code is usable anywhere, it's probably not useful anywhere, uh, <laughs> uh, which is a fun, a fun quote. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. That's another famous quote from programming. Uh, you should generalize your code just about as much as you need to and then stop. Um, this is from the comic XKCD, very good comic, it's been going on for like forever, check it out. Just the four letters XKCD, if you don't know, whatever, moving on. Uh, this is my main complaint, over abstraction is my main complaint with the JavaScript world and the, ba the back end front end world of Java, where JavaScript developers are just, they hate writing code so much, they write all these systems that like generate code for them and it's, then they need systems to manage those, then they need systems to manage the different version conflicts of all of those, and they need systems to manage the different, Systems that manage all the different version conflicts of all the different systems that manage it. It's a mess. Anyway. Um, flexible code. Flexible. This is a pretty intuitive piece of vocab. Code is flexible when we can make it do multiple things and when we can use it in different ways. Um, so when we generalize code, we tend to make it more flexible. But like, you know, not always. Um, so when we write our components, if you're writing a component that can only be used on like one Game object, that's not very flexible. If you write our components in ways that we can use them on multiple game objects, that's more flexible. Previously, you saw me split up the input and the controller class. I had input that was pretty much only going to be used by the player class, but then the thing that actually moves the object around and follows the rules, um, that is the, uh, uh, sorry, I got a spam call during that. Um, that is the, uh, 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 I lost my train of thought. <clears throat> 
flexible part because we can use an AI or we can use our own input or we can write a keyboard input and a mouse input. We can write different input scripts that all and like turn them on and off and then just have the one, um, the one movement class. Um, I often have all of my, if I have players and uh, AI enemies or, or whatever moving, I'll use the same code to move both of them and I'll have them all just sort of be agents is the word I tend to use. Um, and that allows me to write my systems pretty coherently. Um, and, and, and then it allows me to add features to the AI very easily because anything the player can do, the AI can do, um, which is great. Um, in Unity, uh, we, often, we also make our code flexible by not hard coding any of like, the, the, the properties we care about. Um, so if I have something like uh, movement speed, I wouldn't type that directly into my code. I would make a, a, you know edit, editable in the inspector movement speed and then if I have a fast player or a slow player, fast enemy or slow enemy, they could have the same script and I could just change that in the inspector. And that's very flexible. Um, so we wanna make our appropriate properties editable that way. Um, it also means making our, our code, our components, as small as possible so that we can like mix and match them. Um, and then we can build up more behaviors. You know, if I have a bunch of, if my enemy might be look messy for it to have like 15 different components that give it its different like you know, aim at you, look at you, look at this, aim at that, move in this way, shoot this type of thing. Um, but, if, but I can create and design enemy AI just by mixing and matching their different behaviors. That's super powerful and allows me to like have a lot more flexibility and freedom as a game designer and as someone creating the AI. And I don't have to rewrite all this code all the time. Um, <clears throat> and that goes hand in hand with code being modular. Um, so modular is, is, a, is a more um, flexible, is more like user centric term modular is like the more system centric term, but we're kind of talking about the same thing about reusability and recombinability. Um, so by making our code with, without many dependencies and having the code worry about itself, I use that phrase a lot worry, um, but it handles its own internal systems and it has an API on the outside and that's it's just, I can just pick it up and move it and put it down and it won't break anything. Um, uh, uh, that, that is, that is what we want. So modular code, kind of the same, same concepts here, but, but different ways we would use the words. Uh, some more vocab, parents and children, less of an architecture vocab, more of a unity concept, but it's pretty important. So, <clears throat> um, uh, game objects can be children of other game objects. And we know that that changes how they move. The, as the parent moves, the game object would not move relative to the parent, but thus move because the parent's moving. Um, uh, and same with rotation and scale. Uh, and, and we, as a architecture, as a design of our systems, we want a game object's parents to like control its children. And for any game object with all of its children, we want that to be kind of a contained unit. I don't want multiple children that are like competing with each other or an object outside of the parent to be going in and telling the object is it children for it to move around, like it can get very messy. Um, so if we keep our code organized in like a hierarchical way and we have that somewhat match the actual unity hierarchy, things just get a lot easier. Um, uh, uh, a good example, it would be, you know, if you see here on this, this screenshot audio, um, this audio component, if I disable the audio component, I just successfully disabled audio. I just muted my game um, just by enabling and disabling this one component and all of the audio are children of that. Um, in practice, that would be a less uh, practical example. It wouldn't always work because your audio, uh, often your audio sources get tied to like the character footsteps, as you can see in this, in this example. Um, but the, uh, so now we have some dependency where those footsteps need to like be positioned in space so that I can like hear them left and right relative to the camera. Um, this is from a 2D game where that's not as much of a problem, but for VR 3D stuff, that's not a great example. But anyway, um, and you also see there's an environment uh, game object. This is just an empty game object being used as a folder. Um, so we gotta be, keep our eyes on those, make sure we don't have scales and, and scaling the empty parents. Uh, okay, next piece of vocab is singleton. A singleton is a uh, object that enforces the rule that there can only be one of it. <laughs> so we can only have one singleton. It is a singleton. It, there's a, it's a single one ton, one thing. Um, when we enforce that there can only be one thing, 
uh, that allows us to be confident that if I go find any instance that I can find of my uh, camera manager or my scene manager or whatever, I know that I'm getting the same instance that everybody else is getting and we're all talking to the same thing because there's only one. Um, so that's the singleton pattern. Um, singleton pattern also provides an easy way to get that access. Um, so here I'm, in the, I'm showing you game object at find object at uh, blah, 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 blah. One second. <clears throat> here I'm showing you game object at find object of type, which is a Unity feature that just allows a game object just to search for a component of some type. And if it finds one, it finds one. If we have more than one component, it, we don't know which one it's going to find. We can't be confident. Um, and we'll get bugs, but if it's a singleton, we do know that which one it will find. It will find the only one because it can only find one because it's a singleton. Um, so that is this pattern. Singletons are dangerous and bad in many, many ways. They can cause nightmares and headaches for many other reasons. Basically, all of your dependencies, you know, while none of your game, like your player and your UI and your, your enemies, they're all no longer uh, dependent on each other. They're all dependent on this one thing. <laughs> Uh, we can get some some fun errors that way. We tend to not like singletons, but also love them. It's like a, you know, it's a trouble. It's a troubling dynamic we have. Um. <laughs> this one's pretty good. Okay, <clears throat> a breather, a pause, a respite. Okay, what are we trying to even do in the first place? That's this part of the talk. We have some objectives. You can probably infer some of these objectives from some of the vocab we've went over. Modular, flexible, reusable, editable, debuggable, and this thing called SRP, single responsibility principle. Um, <laughs> humor based on my pain. Okay, um, modular and flexible. Uh, I think I, I think we kind of already covered that one, uh, but basically, hey, these concepts, it's good to have our code be like that. Yeah, yeah, good, good. We want our code to be reusable. Be lazy, right? Be lazy, write your code systems, write a really good character controller and use it in 10 different projects. I've written an entire, like, uh, uh, I think fairly competent grid uh, system for making like Sokoban style games. I've used that like seven times. It's, it's wonderful. I keep adding little features and changing it, you know, as needed. But like, now I can make game jams just boom, good to go. Um, be lazy, right? <laughs> if you get really good and write a really nice clean system that you can reuse, uh, then you can sell it on the asset store and have other people buy it or just put it on GitHub uh, for free and let anyone use it. Or you can go use other people's code that they've written and these modular systems that, they, that already exist and are pretty good. Go for it. I mean, I mean, in the context of like my assignments and what you are and are not allowed to do, like for as learning exercises because you're in school here, like don't go steal code. Uh, but like when you're actually making real projects, and somebody's already written like a, you know, a camera movement system called Cinema Machine, and you can get it in the package manager in Unity. Uh, it's great. Just use that. Yeah. Uh, make your code editable. Make your code edit editable editable edit CNN and me. Make your code editable. Let your code use the inspector, uh, and have your code be adjustable without coding. As I was talking about with flexible and modular, and making all of your components. Uh, small and bite size. You can make new variations of enemy AI by adding different types of components, for example. Um, this allows something that Ryan Hipple, a, uh, a game programmer at Shell Games, uh, refers to as emergent design um, as a broad concept, but, but uh, this is a thing, they didn't invent this, but specifically talking about super bite sized Unity components where you can just kind of mix and match them and see what you get without breaking anything. Um, it allows your designers, which is maybe you with a different hat on, maybe not a beanie, maybe a, a baseball cap. Um, uh, it allows you to uh, 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 come up with new new things in your game and your and your projects and your your systems. Right? Um, Vacation Simulator has a really strong underlying system that allows them to create add all these little surprises and little things that happen when you you know take a snowball and 
bring it into the beach level and it just melts in your hand. And it's like, oh, that, you know, that didn't break anything. It, this was kind of a chance to add some comedy to the game. Um, so if your code is editable, you're able to, you know, discover more features and more possibilities in the way. Um, I was once making a little top-down arena shooter, a game very similar to our sort of the sample project that a lot of my videos are using. Um, and I once added on accident an enemy to a bullet slot. I added a prefab for what bullet the enemy would shoot, and I added the enemy to that. Um, so instead of shooting a bullet, it shot out an, another enemy, and that enemy shot out another enemy, and that enemy shot, and it was just like this like virus. Um, and I was like, wow, it didn't break anything. My pathfinding system just worked. My spawning system just worked. My it finding a reference to the player and like following you, it all just worked because I wrote in some nice flexible code. And I was able to discover like, this would be a pretty cool enemy AI. They like, you know, like a, so I wrote, I, you know, changed it up and so it wouldn't be infinite, but I wrote like a big mama enemy that shot out little targeting missiles. Um, and then I kind of made them look like wasps and a, uh, a honey bee. It didn't make sense. Don't worry, don't, don't yell at me about the, the wasp bee thing. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, what idiot wrote this code? <laughs> Me. Okay. Your code needs to be debuggable. You need to be able to figure out what's wrong with your code and the way you write the code can make it easier to do that. You don't just get better at someone who uh, uh, is, a, is able to figure out what's wrong with your code. You can be a better programmer by making that really easy and not being someone who's like super in tune with the underlying systems of C-sharp. Like if that sounds complicated and annoying, how about instead you write your code in a way that makes it really apparent when something goes wrong? Um, comments, right? What is this doing? What does this function do? Is it difficult to sit there and reverse engineer code and try to like figure out how it works? Yes. Could you just read a comment that tells you what it does? Great, easier for sure. Um, naming your functions in very clear ways. We call this self-documenting. Naming your functions and variables in a way that allows you to read the code and it's almost a little bit closer to like English grammar of like, this is what it does. Um, and fragile code is good. Often we talk about writing a architecture allows our code to be bulletproof. I can take something and put it in somewhere else and it, it won't break, it's just gonna work because I've reduced my dependencies and everything's just clean. Um, yes, wonderful. But we also like fragile code. We like code that breaks. Because if it breaks, I wanna know about it and I wanna know exactly what broke so I can go fix it. Um, so while I'm in development, I want error messages. I want all of the error messages. I want them to appear and I want them to be helpful. Um, if you have a, a check to see if something is null before you use a reference to it, you could add a little else statement that's like, hey, debug.log warning, this was null. Um, instead of just skipping over that part, right? You can spit out these messages, these errors, um, and you can make your code more fragile. You can get rid of that if null check, and then you just see the null and you click on it, like, oh, there it is, this is null, like, I need to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, uh, we like our error messages. Uh, for anyone who's familiar with Python, you might be like, what? I didn't. That doesn't sound right to me. Well, C Sharp has a much more strict language, is a much more pedantic language where we have to be particular with our types and our variables and we have to be very, you know, and it spits out a warning when we, uh, we try to cast a, you know, a float to an integer or something like that. It's like, hey, what are you doing here? Um, uh, you know, we accidentally made a double and now everything's breaking and it's like, why, why can't you just work? Why is it so fragile and picky and finicky? And the answer is like, if you are casting a variable on accident from one type to another, like you really should know about that and you really should do it on purpose and C sharp makes you say so. Well, languages like Python kind of like let it slide. They just assume you know what you're doing, which means the errors you get in C sharp, it's like, yo, error right here. And you're like, oh, I have to add the cast thing. How annoying. And in Python, the code just runs and it just executes. And then it like, you're, you know, all your numbers are getting rounded and you don't know why. And it's like, now I gotta figure out how this code's running and gotta step through it and, and like debug it. And instead, in C Sharp, we got an error, we double clicked on it, it brought our cursor to the line number, and we can go fix it. There it is, we know what's wrong with it. Um, so fragile code is good. Uh, and then we want to, before we deploy out to the world, make it more robust and, and catch our errors and maybe, maybe hide them or whatever. So. <clears throat> Uh, 
The single responsibility pre principle. The single responsibility principle, SRP. Uh, this is a broad programming concept that means that one thing owns one thing. Uh, multiple systems are not in charge of controlling one thing. I'm using the term thing very broadly here. Um, every component in our game does only one thing. My player movement moves my player. My weapon manager handles my player's weapons. My input handles input and passes it on to the player movement script. My UI handles a little health bar. I don't have all that wrapped up in one script, the player controller. Um, by making things responsible for only one behavior and how we classify what one behavior is depends on you know, your code and your language and all that. Um, but this, is, this, is, uh, this allows us to architect our code, our code very cleanly. It may feel silly to have something like a scene manager that just wraps up, a, well, wraps up Unity scene manager functions, but putting all that code in one place means that we can give it an interface and we can change the internals and make a more complicated scene loading without breaking the rest of our code. Um, the less, the, the more systems any one piece of code touches, the more we have to like change one system over there when to fix a bug that was caused by changing a system over here. And it's like, I don't, that's gross. That's spaghetti. Um, so add a component, add functionality. That easy. Should be. It's not that easy though. <laughs> okay. So how? How do we do anything? Well, we have some patterns we can follow. Um, we have uh, some, some, some code patterns like a manager system. We have data-oriented designs. We have event systems, which will be uh, is a separate video on. Uh, and we have component-driven architecture, which is built into Unity. So a managers are allowing us to be, a, to be an interface, to be an, an access point to a single system. In Unity, these are more of our broad systems, like our game manager. You know, if I'm making a solitaire game, I have a game manager that handles my, uh, my checking for win conditions, handles my starting and stopping a timer, uh, handles shuffle and deal functions. Um, it's all sort of there, and the game manager kind of handles that broad game things. It doesn't deal with input at all. It doesn't deal with handling player or something at all. It doesn't really know much about the current state of the game other than like checking for the victory conditions. It's, it's chilling. Um, when we have managers, we often pair them with a singleton pattern um, just to ensure that we only have one manager and we have an easy way to access it. Um, so we could have a level manager that just has a public function for, hey, level's done, finished it. It doesn't know what the fin in the racing game what the finish line is. It doesn't know when the, you know that the the Mario got to the flag or whatever. Um, but something tells it, yo, we're done with the level now, and it goes cool. Uh, when that happens, I turn on this sound effect, and I have the camera zoom in and do a little circle fade, and I you know I just I handle all of these different systems, these confetti cannons, um, and the player, the thing that actually you know, hit the flag that does know about the, uh, when it, when a level end is reached, it doesn't need to know anything about the confetti cannon or what music should be played, right? Because it's just a player. It should just worry about itself. Manager allows us to um, abstract that because um, we have one event that touches many systems. Um, all these systems can be talking to the manager. The manager can talk to them. You know, my game manager might be, be dependent, might have a dependency where it talks to the audio manager, but my player doesn't care about background music. So I can go through that manager. Um, there are bad ways to do it. Um, so here in my example, I have um, a UI manager that could draw every single uh, uh, health bar on the screen. And it would need to know about the position and location of every single enemy in order to draw their health bars. Uh, that would be weird. Um, instead, we would have enemies deal with their own health bars. That would be a lot smarter. Um, but when you know you could coherently make an argument that like oh all the you know all the heads up display things should just be on the heads up display manager and it's like yeah that could make sense doesn't though so figuring out when and how to use managers uh, comes with practice and time and, and you know you know just if it makes your life easier that's a good thing <laughs> um, remember the goal of all this architecture talk is like 
We want to make our life easy. <laughs> um, so some questions you can ask yourself to figure out if something should be a manager, if you could make it a manager, um, is uh, uh, it's on the screen here. I'll, I guess I'll read them out. Um, is the data I'm referencing centralized? Is it conceptually centralized data? Uh, would it make other things simpler? <laughs> um, would it minimize repetition? Uh, would it minimize dependencies? Uh, would it increase dependencies? <laughs> uh, maybe we don't do a manager for that. Um, does this manager need to reference a lot of other things? And how many other things does the manager need to reference? Um, does it need to know about a bunch of objects that are getting created and destroyed? Or could we somehow flip that dependency around? We can flip dependencies around using a thing called an event system, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll leave that on screen for a, for a sip here. Okay, data-oriented design. This is similar to managers. It's a way of taking things that would previously have to talk to each other, like a player and its health bar, and it would give them a central place where they can both reference that is available. But instead of that central place being a singleton that we need to worry about, that central place that is always available here is just data, game data stored somewhere. In Unity, we can use scriptable objects to make uh, universal data that is independent of any scene. It's not a game object, it's just always there. Uh, so we don't have to worry about our scene loading and our game da layer orders in order to give us this layer orders, or our uh, loading, or loading order, in order to give, let me back up. We don't need to worry about scene loading orders or what game object existed before another game object when they're both trying to reference, you know, each other or the same thing in a, in a, in a scene, they can just always reference the data. I said that poorly. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take three, take a third take. Uh, when you load a scene, we don't, we're not always confident what order objects load in. They might both have start functions. Um, maybe your singleton, your manager has a start function that initializes itself. Maybe your player has a start function that goes and gets to the manager and says, Hey, something is important. Um, and the initialization needs to happen first. We'd call that a race condition because maybe the player gets loaded before the manager. Um, and then it talks to it, but it hasn't been initialized yet. Um, data oriented design not only clears up all of our references in the same way that singletons do, but it also can clear up a lot of these race conditions because that data is just always there. It's universal. Um, I love data oriented design. I use it all the time in my, in my game projects. I use scriptable objects so often. Um, it's got some downsides. It can get really messy and it can make really small games a little bit more complicated. Um, it's sort of got this sweet spot of like how much your game uses data to start using data oriented design where you have very simple games. It's like maybe not worth it to like, you know, put stuff in data and you have very complicated games where it's like, now you have a thousand things lying around. You need some kind of structure to organize it instead. Um, use like a spreadsheet or something. Um, but it's great. It's super good. We're going to, we're going to go over how to do it. Event systems, event systems, uh, event, we minimize dependencies by uh, disconnecting a function call like, hey, controller, public move or whatever. We disconnect that from a specific reference to it. So previously I had the example of a game manager being told when the, uh, when the game ended. Um, if we could make it so that you could call that, hey, the level's over function from anywhere, uh, uh, then we could we could clean up our our code, uh, and we could do that with an event, which is sort of allows these function calls to be universal without having a dependency associated with them. We could also uh, have the player talk to the level man level manager and say I'm done, and then the level manager could broadcast an event like Hey, level's done, and all these listeners that are no the manager is no longer dependent on doesn't need direct references to it. Just Hey, level's done, and all those managers would be like I'm going to listen to that event or not, uh, and then they can handle themselves. So event systems can minimize dependencies because um, an, uh, an event doesn't need a listener, right? Listener being something that's like paying attention to that event. Level manager can be like, hey, level's done, and if no one's listening to it, we don't care. We just game moves on, nothing breaks. Um, as opposed to if the level manager had a specific reference to like the audio player, and then we didn't have the audio player, we'd be like, oh, that's null. 
um, into an event system, audio player just never started listening to the event, subscribed. Um, and so it goes, hey, you know, level's done. No one cares, but nothing's broken. Um, so that's, that's event system. We can broadcast events, um, and then listeners can sort themselves out, whether or not they care about it, what they do with it. Uh, we use events all the time. Unity has a built-in event system that you have been using since day one of Unity. We write code in the function called start, and Unity will broadcast to every game object, hey, if you have a start function, run it now. And if you don't, don't buy you. Um, <laughs> that's an event system. That allows us to just write the word start, and then it just works. And we can get rid of that, and it just works. It's great. Um, so we don't need start or update to function. Um, there's no dependency there between Unity's like game loop manager and needs to know all the game objects or whatever. Um, so uh, event systems are great, but sometimes you can use them and you'll end up in a situation where you thought you needed an event system, but it turned out there's like only ever one thing that listens to it. And it's like, okay, well, why do we need an event system for like one, to, one thing to one thing? You know, that feels like kind of a lot of code, this event system on top of what could be a direct function call. Um, but if it's one thing out to many things, oh, event systems make our life easier. And if we have dependencies going one way and we like kind of want to flip that dependency around, so it's like, you know, my audio manager example is like now the audio manager is de it needs to know about the level manager's event so it could subscribe to it, as opposed to the level manager needing to know about the audio manager to tell it something. Um, we can kind of flip around our dependencies. <laughs> C sharp, not just Java. Yeah, love the semicolon. Yeah, component-driven architecture is a uh, universal programming concept, um, and it is the one that Unity uses. Unity is built with this architecture in mind in its systems, so we need to get on board and use it. Uh, you are all learning programming uh, with with me, so. You probably think this is how most programming works, is with component-driven architecture. You're in intimately familiar with it. But uh, often when programmers come from other systems, like from web development or whatever, into Unity, they, they're like, ooh, I want to use uh, ECS, or I want to use uh, MVC, or whatever, um, whatever those acronyms mean. Uh, and they, they don't get on board with the component-driven architecture. They sort of redo things the ground up with the ways they're familiar with, and it's just gross and bad because they're working, they're like fighting against the system that's already built into Unity. We use components uh, attached to game objects. Component-driven architecture is that system where one object can have a modular set of components. Um, for example, if you had a strictly hierarchical, a strictly hierarchical, I can't, hierarchical, hierarchical, If you had a strictly hierarchical, I can't say this word, top-down organizational structure of class hierarchies, um, and you had something like a car that had wheels, and be like, okay, well, cars have four wheels, and wheels and engine, cars and engine, and has four wheels, and it's like, okay, time to make a bike. It's like, okay, well, car has four wheels, so bike has to also have an engine, and we need to rewrite the engine code, and we need to rewrite the wheel code because it's like different and. Things get super messy, um, and it doesn't fit that system. In game programming, having a wheel or engine be these sort of modular things that I can just add to objects that can support having multiple mix and match components, uh, that makes life easy. And that is component-driven architecture. Um, and that's exactly what Unity uses. This is like not, uh, not, not, a, not a standard programming thing. <laughs> This is a system that Unity developed that we can use, right? We extend mono behavior. Um, but because we, Unity uses component-driven architecture, um, we haven't actually done much object-oriented programming yet. And that's fine for now. We're going to get into it. But, you know, we can get a lot done without it for now. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm losing my ability to speak. I feel more like this right now than, than this. Okay, so 
How do we actually, in Unity, make any of this happen? In class, we're going to go over all the various things I want to go over, which I think are like introduce event systems ideas, and we'll have another assignment for that, and talk about structs and data structures and, and how to use data structures. Um, but for now, we'll, we'll stick to the broad non-code tools and tricks. Uh, dependency diagrams. Uh, map your dependencies, graph them out, and you will very easily, very clearly, visually discover what is good and what is bad, uh, because you'll have lots of arrows pointed or all over the place. And hey, it looks like spaghetti. Mm, probably spaghetti. Um, I literally do this all the time. I just keep little notepads on my desk 24-7. There's always a notepad on my desk, and I, I have a little whiteboard too, and, and, and it's great. You can have, there are uh, plugins built into your IDEs that can generate flowcharts. They don't work really well with Unity because of all of Unity's built-in components. Um, it gives you a whole mess and you have to like do a bunch of setup to tell it to ignore all that stuff when it builds the flowcharts. But just grab it yourself. Um, so, also because of the component-driven architecture, it doesn't, doesn't do those well. Um, so yeah, uh, Lecture is done. It's not done. We got the in-class part of the of the pragmatic. How do we do the stuff part? But I got memes, so memes. <laughs> I like Brooklyn Nine Nine. Any fans of Brooklyn Nine Nine out there? It's a good show. <sighs> yeah, me too. <laughs> having a pretend conversation about 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 yeah. You know. I'm also surprised about how old, how young Andy Samberg looks. Um, you're going to do great. You're going to be amazing. You're going to write code that makes it very easy to write simple code, and you're going to make life easy for yourself. You don't need to be an expert programmer. You're, you can be a dum-dum, and you write code that, that's really good for dum-dums. <laughs> you're not a dum-dum. You're very smart. Um, one of the things you do very smartly is you... Is you as you, as, uh, as you write your code in clean, easy to use, easy to edit ways. Uh, remember, you need to write your code uh, in such a way that for you three months ago, three months from now, after five beers, can still read it and understand it. So that's the lecture. We did it. I will see you in class. Uh, enjoy the memes, I guess. Um,